<laughs> All right, thanks. So, this is my first presentation on a big stage. So uh, we'll see how this goes. It may be a little bit rough. Um, but I work for Deterra. My name's Matt Smith. I'm a software engineer there. Uh, Deterra is a startup based in Silicon Valley. Uh, we launched, actually, our product just about three weeks ago. So we're pretty new. Uh, this is a little bit about me. So I used to work at Riverbed. Uh, I worked on the uh, steel stripped framework there. Um, I'm a big fan of cycling, cats, board games, especially Eldritch Horror. Um, and if you want to find me on IRC, my, my handle's up there. I typically lurk on the, uh, the Cinder forums. So a little bit about our company. Uh, we have an elastic data fabric. Uh, it's essentially an iSCSI-based uh, drop-in replacement for uh, a Ceph solution. Uh, it's more performant, uh, way easier to configure. I'm sure most of us have seen uh, the, the pain points that come with sort of setting up Ceph. Uh, we try and eliminate a lot of those. Uh, we've gotten funding from uh, some pretty big names like Pradeep. Uh, and you know, overall, it's going pretty well. So in terms of the architecture of the product, let me get most of this up here. So it's, it's based uh, essentially a, an intent-based system. Um, it's intent-based uh, specifically uh, application intent. So instead of being something like a, a volume-centric system, which is what we're most familiar with uh, and dealing with in elastic block storage devices, we're application-based. We have things, uh, essentially our top-level container is something called an app instance. That app instance contains storage instances. Well, it's, it's not on this slide, but it contains storage instances and, and volumes. But the main po purpose behind this is that uh, our product picks where the, st uh, essentially it picks where the storage goes. Like you, you, you describe that within your application, and then as you can see right here, depending on the needs of your application, the intent of your application, it distributes it uh, amongst either the high performance flash arrays that we have within the product or the slower spinning disks, um, but high capacity spinning disks. So the product itself is extremely scriptable. Um, it's pretty much meant to be used by DevOps. Um, this is an, a, an example of the, uh, the API for our product. It's got a nice interface. Uh, you can, it, it's essentially just JSON-based REST queries. Um, you can create a, and do everything that you need to with the product through a REST query. And it's meant to be very, very easy to use and very easy to understand. Um, at least most of the time, uh, I end up interacting th with the product through uh, generally requests, uh, the, the Python library. So this is just an example of what you would, you know, the steps that you would take to, uh, you know, log into the product and then configure your first application instance. And in this case, you can think of an application instance really as an entire application's worth of storage. It's not just a single volume, like you're not provisioning just that one volume. We do have the option of provisioning a single volume, but it's within the context of an application in instance. And so since we're talking about instances, we have to talk about templates. So this is really what the, uh, the bulk of this talk will be about, is, is templates. Um, it's, what, it's that sort of new thing that we bring to the table with our product, because you know, anyone can change the model of the way that uh, you, know, you provision volumes, we're just, with templates, we make it extremely easy to describe what you want for an application once, and then spawn as many of those as you want afterwards, and then even change them while they've already been spawned, and it changes everything that happens to inherit from that template. So uh, it's, it's, th this is the main focus of being application-centric, is with these templates. So templates first give us the power to describe an application. They give us control of 
quality of service, snapshot policies, ACLs, IP pools, volume sizes, and configs, maybe the weather. <laughs> it, it gives us control of a ton of stuff uh, to do with, uh, with this particular application. Uh, once we've described all of these different things, because normally you would have to describe them for individual volumes. In this case, you describe them for the application, and it can be per volume within that application. You get all of that stuff for free every time that you instantiate it. Um, we can have many application instances. These are just templates that have been instantiated, bound templates, uh, that relate to you know, that particular template. So that one template can have many instances. And then you can go back into that template. Say later on, you decide you want to add a whole, you know, X number of additional applications based off of this template. And you realize that you're over provisioning the, uh, you know, es essentially the amount of storage that you have or, you know, whatever metric. You can go back into the template and all of these live application instances that are being used by, you know, users, <laughs> uh, you can change that metric inside the template, and it will reflect in everything that is still bound to that template. Like every, every application instance that you have generated from the template will be affected by it. So this brings us to sort of a bit of a conflict that we have. Uh, it's, it's not a super big conflict, but it's more of a, a difference in paradigms. So Cinder is very much a volume-centric manager, uh, whereas Datera is application-centric, as we've been talking about. With Cinder, you have a single volume. That volume is atomic. Uh, it, for the most part, has zero relationships with any other volumes. There's some you can get with consistency groups. Um, but that particular volume, especially at the volume level, doesn't know anything about any other volume. Now, we sort of break this with Datera and, and our application centricity. These, these volumes have relationships with each other. Um, they, share, they share information. That information is located in the parent you know, data structure, and the volumes will inherit it. So we, we are essentially sort of round peg square holing something right here <laughs> with, uh, uh, what, with what I'm about to do. But it, it seems to work pretty well, actually. So what we do is we leverage volume types. So in Cinder, you have uh, the concept of a volume type. Uh, most folks use this for um, essentially designating quas for different volume types. Like you can have the levels gold, bronze, silver. Uh, and then each of those is a separate volume type with uh, different information about them. And so that information is passed in to the driver um, which is provisioning the volume, and then it gets you that particular type of volume. Well, in this case, we don't want to have you know, a thousand different keys that the uh, admin has to essentially put into the extra specs list, uh, or the extra specs for that volume type, because it would just, it, it would be a huge hassle, because every time you create a new volume type, you have to set each one of these different things. So instead, we allow the user to uh, set a template key. So this, this is what it looks like when you actually set that template, uh, or at least in the extra specs. So this, this is what the admin has control of. So if, if you don't know much about extra specs, it, it essentially allows you to set a, a set of key values or key value pairs. And depending on the type of operator that you're using, there will be a comparison uh, between what the driver advertises and what you actually get or, or request um, with the volume type. And if there's a match, if, they, if it can match against what the driver advertises, then the sender scheduler will, scheduler will pick that volume type, or sorry, pick that driver for provisioning your volume type. Uh, and if, if you've ever worked with it, you know, if you ever type anything wrong here, uh, you will probably not get any drivers selected, and your volume will never get created. <laughs> and it, it, it has a little bit of a cryptic error message associated with it. So this is just examples of d uh, essentially what you can do, or different combinations of volume type settings that you can use. 
So that brings us to the demo, and this is going to be live. So, yeah. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if it even shows up up here. All right. So first, we have our OpenStack instance. So this is what I'm going to be running against. We have our Dayterra backend, and it's running. You can see essentially nothing is running against here, which is good, because they're actually using this over in the booth. Nobody's using it. Um, and then, I actually, just sort of as a bonus, this is the, the Terra API browser. Um, I probably won't have time to go into this, but it's there. <laughs> and it, it, it's super handy. So we don't see anything currently running right now. And I'll go ahead and start this uh, make p demo b austin c10. So this takes just a, just a moment to set up. And what this is doing is it is, in, so it's a, taking a trusty image, it's uploading it to about 10 volumes, Dayterra volumes. In this case, um, they're all created with a particular template. Um, so that, that template is specified by that, if, if we go back here while this is running. Present. So it's specified by this template key. This is how the admin picks the template, in this case, FIO OS perf. So this is the template that we're going to be instantiating on the Dayterra, on the Dayterra box for each of these volumes. Now, we do have the capability to support multiple templates, but the, for, the sake of the temp, for, for the sake of the demo, it'll just be a single template here. So. Each of these are getting, uh, having the trusty image uploaded into their volume, which is instantiated from the template. It gets all of that inherited quas stuff. And then we're, we're going to boot from each of these volumes. So each of these volumes will have uh, an instance running. And we should be able to see that in the OpenStack GUI or in Horizon. So we're still, we're still booting the instances, but the volumes are all created. It's just a matter of. Uh, Booting those instances. Yeah. And we could do this in parallel, but <laughs> for simplicity's sake, it's still going. So, what we're going to be doing is once we have all of these up and running, we're going to start changing things about the template. So, all of these are going to get FIO run against them, it's going to start generating traffic. Uh, and it's essentially going to be saturating the current link between the initiator and the back end. Um, and generally, when you, you, you don't want to have no quas on something, but we're going to have uh, no quas initially. And so it's going to behave badly. All right, almost there. So it's setting up FIO right now. And. If uh, we wanted to see the current application instances that are on this, uh, on this box, the REST API makes that super easy. We just go ahead and log in, go to the application, in or actually, we should go to the application templates. We'll just do a get request on FIO OS perf. Uh, oop, FIO. OK, so we'll submit that request. We get it right here, and we can actually see all the different app instances that have inherited from this template. So all of these app instances are con under control by the template. And if we modify anything about this template, all of those will inherit it. So all of our stuff should be started by now. Yeah, it is started. And we can see we're doing about a little over a gig per second to the back end. So saturating the, at least the current link. So what we'll do is go to the template, uh, template right here, pick our template that we care about, which is right there. And then we'll create a quas policy for it. So we're going to en enable a performance policy, and we'll restrict this. pretty severely. 
So now each of these instances will be using only a max bandwidth of 4096 kilobytes per second. And if we go back to the Daytera uh, dashboard, we should see when, once it actually takes effect. Did I save it? <laughs> I may not have saved it. Templates. OK, I did save it. 4096, I set that in bandwidth. That's max total. OK, yeah, it just took it a moment to do it. So everything's been super restricted. We're now down to about 50 megs per second through that same link. If we go to, uh, if we go to the template, we can look at one of the application instances under that template and see that it has inherited the max total bandwidth. So we can change anything about this, snapshot policies, ACLs, performance, um, any of these different metrics, uh, and everything will inherit from that that's been instantiated from the template. And you can clone templates and make small modifications too, so you don't have to, like if you, if you have a basic starting point, you can essentially recreate it easily. Uh, all right, so back to where I was before. OK. So we got the demo. And so for future steps, the, and this is you know, pretty important, because there are some, f some pretty severe restrictions on what we can do, at least right now, trying to get templates to work with Cinder, because Cinder is so, uh, is so volume-centric. Now, at least with Deterra's application instances, you can have many different volumes and many different exports uh, under a single application. And so at least right now, we're treating the uh, application almost like a volume. So there's at least currently the restriction of a single volume and a single uh, export per application. But that can be gotten around. Like there's, there's some functionality there for migrating existing volumes from a backend onto Cinder that we'll be exploring for getting multiple volumes supported in that application, but still recognized by Cinder and still managed by Cinder. Um, we also would like to support customizing template parameters in Horizon, because uh, at least right now, all that template parameter modification has to be done through the Deterra GUI. Um, the only thing that we can actually do through Cinder is instantiate the template. C Cinder does know that the template exists through the extra specs, and you can control that there. But in terms of modifying the template afterwards, it has to be done through the GUI. Um, we do also want to support unbinding volumes from the template, because uh, at least in our current version of the product, 1.0, we don't support instantiating an application instance from the template and then unbinding it from that template so it stands alone. And then if you modify the template afterwards, not having it modify the application instance. So this, it's, these are all on the roadmap, um, but at least they're not currently available. And then if we have time, I would like to w end world hunger. <laughs> so, uh, were there any questions? I think I have a minute and a half. So, yeah. Sorry, what was that? Uh, so we are actually a combination. So at least right now. So we do plan on supporting commodity hardware. Um, that is, uh, within the next like three to six months, we will be running on much more, uh, a much broader spectrum of hardware. But at least right now, if you purchase our product, it is both a software and hardware SKU. So it comes together. But commodity is in the future. Like, it's coming. Anything else? All right. Thank you all for coming.